Those of you in the foyer would please come join us. We will begin our Sunday morning service and welcome to each and every one of you that are here. Catherine? One minute, one minute, one more minute. Okay. okay. Just. Jeff Adams. Jeff Adams to the front, please. Jeff Adams. All right, let's all stand this morning and turn to your neighbor and say good morning. Good. Morning. Something good is going to happen today. Something good going on. All right. Okay, now turn to your other side, if you didn't turn to your other side already, and say something good is going to happen to you today. All right. Are you guys ready to praise the Lord this morning? Yes. It's time. Everybody go like this. Remember this? That'll come back later. But we're shaking off this morning. We're just here to just be with the king this morning. So let's remember that as we worship him.
All right, everybody, do you remember this? Yeah? yeah. Everybody? We're shaking it off this morning. I don't think I see enough hands in the air.
Jesus, we praise you. Praise God this morning. Praise God this morning. Jesus, you're worthy of a praise. You're worthy of all our praise, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just ask for your, your mercy on us, Lord. That your heavens would open up to us today, Father. That your Holy Spirit would be poured out, Father. And may the words spoken today, Lord, penetrate our hearts, Father. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be over the service this morning, Father. We praise you. Thank you, praise team, for that deep worship. Uh, let's pray together, if you would please bow your heads. <clears throat> God, we assemble this day to give you honor and glory. You are an incredible God. We know that you love us extremely deeply, and we love you back. Father, Father God, your word reveals yourself to us. In the word, we see that our God is an all-powerful creator who never changes and who loves and loves more. Our God is a savior who came and taught, who suffered and died, and was resurrected. And our God is an empowering Holy Spirit who guides us day by day. Father, we want to walk in your will. Those of us who are asleep, awaken us, revive us. Reveal to us each individually those areas in our lives where we need to improve. So our actions are driven by love for others. Everyone we encounter is someone you have sent across our path to witness to. Father, we thank you for all the many, many blessings you've poured into each of our lives and the lives of our loved ones. We ask that you open our hearts and speak to us through this morning's message. We ask in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Uh, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone and welcome to those of you joining us on the internet. Uh, this time we would especially like to welcome any first-time visitors if you would just raise your hand, if you're a first-time visitor. I see one. We have a gift for you folks, and we would simply ask uh, your name and where you live. Um, Robert and Jennifer Leonberger, and we live here in Spring Hill. Great. Thank you for joining us. And I see another hand. And we would just ask your name and where you live. Kim Wagner, and I'm from Bethesda. Kim, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Any other first-time visitors? Uh, I see young hands going up for the other bread. I'll toss one here. And I'll toss one to this side. Oh, I fell a little short there, Joseph. Good catch. Thank you. Pastor? Thank you, Mark. Where are our visitors again? Right there. You guys from Spring Hill? Yeah, where were you born? Chicago and Hawaii. Very good. I know nobody's actually born in Spring Hill. Everybody's kind of transplanted here. And ma'am, uh, where were you born? 
Alabama. Okay, let's give our visitors a nice warm welcome. We're glad to have him here this morning. We pray that the Lord blesses you and strengthens you uh, by his Holy Spirit this morning. Um, we're going to um, do a little uh, PowerPoint presentation this morning. We've got a couple of things we, we need to do. Georgia, you have a, a little bit of an announcement to give first, so come on up here, if you will. We'll let you give the announcement first. Um, today we are selling tickets for our silent auction, which is, which is going to be Sunday, February 20th at 5 o'clock at night. Um, the cost is $5 per person or $20 per family. So if you have 10 people in your family, you get it for 20 bucks. Um, um, the, the amount of things that we are auctioning off on that day are plentiful, plentiful, plentiful. We're, next week, we're going to have a list of all the things. We have restaurants. We have home goods. We have, um, what else do we have, Lisa? Every, ice cream, ice skating, laser tag. <laughs> Anything you could think of. Um, if anybody knows anyone um, that would like to donate something, even services, um, please see Lisa Nimitz. But um, do the countdown. I think it's four weeks away. The silent auction. Proceeds go to all of our youth funds. It's a, an Italian dinner. Can I not say that? It's an Italian dinner, the most important thing, um, with Krista's famous sauce. So you don't want to miss this. You want to invite people. Um, it's the best cause out there. There you go. All right. Yes, it is an Italian dinner. And if you don't come, we're going to send Vito out to your house and to rearrange your legs. Oh, yeah. The empanada auction will be that night as well. So that is an experience in and of itself. So um, be there. And it's uh, obviously we're uh, raising money for an incredibly good cause. So. Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time. Gentlemen, if you will, we want to honor the Lord this morning with our tithes and our offerings and our almsgiving uh, unto the Lord. We want to um, just acknowledge the faithfulness of the Lord in so many areas of our life that he is continually blessed. And I believe everybody in this room can probably think of an area where the Lord has blessed you recently and has covered you and protected you in some manner or some way. So let's be thankful to the Lord this morning. The word of the Lord admonishes us to uh, be cheerful givers. Uh, they use a funny Greek word there when you use the word cheerful. It's the, it's the word hilaros. Um, it's the word that means in English, transliterated, to hilarious. So the Lord loves a hilarious giver. So that's just a, not a happy or just cheerful. It's actually hilarious. Because if you understand and you know what's behind sowing and planting in the kingdom of God, and you see the harvest that is laid up for each one of us, it is a lot to be hilarious over and to be rejoicing in. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your incredible faithfulness to each one of us in this room. Lord, because we have named your name and we are followers, Lord, of your covenant, of your son, of your word. Lord, we know that you have ensured our blessing through the promises that you've given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Lord, this morning we want to show our appreciation for all that you have done for us, the health and the strength that you have given us and the jobs and the houses and the homes and the cars and the children and the families that we have, Lord, the church that we serve in. So many things, Lord, that you have given us. You have blessed us even with our next breath. And we're so appreciative, Lord, that you have considered us. And this morning, Lord, as we uh, gather in this house, we pray that your word, Lord, will pierce through the bone and marrow. And Lord, that you would teach us of your way, teach us of your will, and help us, O oh Lord, to represent the kingdom of God in a manner that is worthy of our callings. We thank you, Lord. We honor you and bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the people of God say, amen. Gentlemen, you can go forward at this time. 
And while they are moving forward, we are going to go ahead and uh, dismiss the children to Children's Church and all the teachers therein. So guys, you can go to your classes. And let's all the rest of us stand up for one moment. Didn't Catherine do a wonderful job leading worship this morning? Absolutely. Anointed of the Lord. Let's take one minute out and just turn around to the person that is behind you and just greet them with a... Uh, it's actually a holy kiss, but... Let's give everybody a hug and welcome somebody that you don't know. Let's welcome our visitors and bless them. All righty, let's everyone find your uh, seat, if you, if you will, quickly. As we were worshiping and the Holy Spirit was moving in the congregation, um, someone had a um, vision in the Lord, and there was a sound of the shofar blowing in here as we were worshiping. Of course, nobody actually was blowing the shofar, but thank you, Catherine. But there was a shofar blowing in here, and then uh, this individual saw uh, a high plateau above us, and uh, floods of, were f of water were flowing over our heads. And um, so if the Lord speaks to you on that, and you have a personal interpretation, that is for you this morning as well. Let's um, open up our Bibles, if you will. I'm going to give you a little PowerPoint presentation. I'm, I'm committed to uh, speaking that which uh, we ended with last week, that I felt the, the, the Lord uh, kind of uh, nudge us in this direction. If you remember last week, we were speaking about the prophetic word for the year 2011 and how important it is and uh, how words mean something to us, and how there would be a great uh, testing, great personal challenges that were going to emerge in this uh, calendar year, and how the Lord was electrifying the fence, so to speak. And what I mean by electrifying the fence is that sometimes as Christians, uh, we sit on the fence of our commitment to the Lord, our life in the Lord, and our life in reality. And sometimes we are neither hot nor cold, but we're kind of like in the middle and lukewarm. And as we're sitting on that fence, the, the vision was given that the Lord was going to electrify the fence, which indicates that he wants us off the fence, so to speak. And he wants us in one place or the other. And we spoke about in Revelation chapter 3 how clearly the Lord said to his church, I would, the Laodicean church, which is the last church, the church of the last days as well. How I wish that you were either hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. And because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And we talked about the profound 
terminology that was used in that particular scripture relating to the word spew out of the mouth, which we uh, indicated was a word that has its root meaning in the word vomit or vomiting. And it's hard to get a picture of that as human beings of the Lord vomiting, um, period, let alone vomiting us out of his mouth. But this is how important this is in the last day church, that the church is either hot or cold, and to at all costs avoid the problem of being lukewarm. So what the Lord does in his great kindness and his great love, great mercy towards us, rather than let us sit on that fence, he electrifies the fence. And we're going to have to hop off in one direction or another. Either we're going to be driven towards the Lord or obviously we'll be driven away from the Lord. And many people in the last days will fall away from the faith, which is a clear um, interpretation of um, the powers that are going to emerge in the last days. The Bible says that men's hearts will fail them for fear over the things that are coming over the earth. It will be a time of great stress and great pressure in the last days. And of course, the Lord wants us to overcome. And in the, in the seven books or the seven churches in the book of Revelation, we find that the greatest admonition to all the churches, even though there was something wrong with each and every church, and the Lord picked that out and pointed it out and asked for a change and a repentance, what he said to every one of them is to him who overcomes. So the Lord wants you to be an overcomer. He just doesn't want you to sit back and live on sloppy grace which means that you just, you know, the Lord's in charge of everything. I'm just going to do anything I want. I, I'm, I'm powerless. I don't have any part to do with this. The Lord's just going to do his thing. I'm just going to hang in there with the Lord, see what happens. This is not the, um, the modus operandi of the Lord. He wants us to participate. He wants you to be a co-worker, a co-builder in the kingdom of God. And he has sent you on a great commission, which is working with him um, to build the kingdom of God. So he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant. And then he gives these incredible promises. So the Lord wants us to participate in that which he is uh, challenging us for, uh, in this year. And, and we also um, spoke about um, the, the, the idea that to him who overcomes, many of the promises of the Lord will manifest themselves not only in the days when you're in heaven, but now on this earth. The Lord has his covenants, his promises, his blessings for his people now in the earth prior to us going to heaven. So I wanted to speak about some of the, um, the obstacles that we uh, run into when we are trying to fulfill our destiny in the Lord. Because all of these things that we spoke about were speaking to the future and speaking to the purpose that we are here and the destiny that we have, not only together, but individually as well. It is my very strong belief that everybody in this room has a personal destiny in the Lord that is known by him and perhaps you don't know what that destiny is. It's very rare that a person actually knows their complete and total destiny. But I believe that every person in this room, according to the word of God, has a future and a hope, a calling, a purpose, and a destiny. And that is, it is the Lord's heart to communicate what that future is to you. So he desires to speak to his children. And in the, in the context of, of what we were speaking about in the year 2011, these great challenges are going to start coming in, uh, personal challenges, as well as world challenges, as well as church challenges, which we're already in. But the Lord wants us to overcome. But there are some things that actually hinder us from being able to 
access our destiny and our future. I want to speak about one of those things this morning because the Lord put this so strongly uh, on, on my heart personally about what he is doing um, in this particular church. And I want to kind of share it with you. It is not designed to be a real exegetical type teaching, but it is designed to give you an overview of what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And then as with all teachings, as, as everything that you hear as a matter of fact, Measure it against the Holy Spirit in you. And hear not only what is being said, but hear what the Spirit is saying to you. This is one of the keys for those of you who like to study the Bible. This is one of the keys. Don't study the Bible only for what it says. Study the Bible for what it says to you as well. And there's a difference between the two. Anybody can have intellect, anybody can have knowledge of the Word of God. But that is not what the Lord is asking for. The Lord has given you this Word personally as well as corporately. This is a love letter from God to you to help you to discern and understand what your future is, what your destiny is, and who you are, and who He is. So we read, we study, not only just to gain knowledge, which a lot of people like to do that. But remember, knowledge puffs up ultimately in the end. And the Bible says all knowledge, 1 Corinthians 13, will be done away with anyway. <laughs> what the Lord is really looking for is what he is speaking to you and how you are responding to him. So that's called a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to God the Father by the Holy Spirit. And this is what his desire is. It's all personal, all personal, as opposed to many, many other religions on this earth, including Islam. This is one of the unique factors and functions of Christianity, that you can have a personal relationship with the one who created you and personal knowledge of his plan for your life. And in that communication, you will know how you are to respond and how you are to obey and how you are to walk in the things that the Lord is speaking to you. So there are some obstacles to our future and our destiny together. And I entitled this um, particular message, The Destructive Power of Judgment. I want to talk to you a little bit about judgment. This is one of the most socially acceptable sins in the church of Jesus Christ, by the way. Because many, many people do not commit adultery. A lot of people aren't smoking cigarettes after service. A lot of you are not going out getting drunk. But many, many people judge in the body of Jesus Christ. And one of the problems with judging is that it brings a curse upon the church and upon the people who are actually doing that judging. But I want to clarify a lot about what the Bible speaks about in terms of def defining what judgment really is. And it may be a little surprising to you to find out. And um, the second part of it is how to overcome the curses of religion. The religious spirit is a birthing point for the spirit of judgment. Uh, we're going to see a little bit about that in a few moments. But I want to start with this plan. There is a plan... Let's see if I have this one on right. It's going to be... Which one do I press, Steve? In the top or the bottom or the side? Forward. Forward. All right. I'm pressing it. Do I have to turn this on or anything? All right. You let me know. How did the Apostle Paul ever teach without... Man, I'm pressing, I'm pressing. There it goes. I'm in. Demonic plan. Am I doing that or are you doing that? All right, I'm pressing. It's not doing anything. Well, in closing this morning, all right, two, three, four. All right. Are you going to do it or am I going to do it? 
All right. While they're figuring this out, um, while they're figuring this out, there is a, uh, um, as, even as the Lord has a plan, the Lord has a plan for all of our lives. That is clear in the book of Jeremiah, that he has a plan for each one of us. At the very same time, there is a demonic strategy that is against us. There's actually a plan, a demonic plan against your life. And a lot of times you can feel something happen in your experience, something in your life. You said, this is definitely not the Lord. Something is wrong here. <clears throat> and sometimes when we let our guard down, the enemy can come in. We are designed to have a hedge of protection around our life. We're hidden in the pinions of the wings of the Lord. We are supposed to be uh, in uh, the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes when we violate the word of the Lord or we violate one of the principles of the kingdom, it creates a little door, a little opening. And that door gets open and the enemy can come in. But we know that the Bible teaches when the enemy comes in, like, the fl like a flood, the Lord comes in and raises a standard. He raises a banner. So the Lord is more powerful than the enemy, but we have to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. It is a foolish, foolish person who does not understand his enemy. And I've said this a hundred times. If I've said it once. <clears throat> when you are in war, when you are in athletics, and today uh, the Chicago Bears are going to find out the same thing, you're going to know, you're going to have to know not only what you can do and what your game plan is, you have to know what the other team is doing. You have to un kind of understand the strategy of that which is opposing you. The demonic forces are in opposition to the kingdom of God. Do you know that the spirit of Islam is against the spirit of God? It is the spirit of Antichrist that is against Israel and the church. Well, to totally ignore rather than to expose the works of the enemy is probably not in the best interest of the church. And it's not in your personal best interest as well. So, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, there are strategies. He uses the word schemata. There are strategies that are set against you that you have to learn how to put on an armor and take up some defensive weapons and also a couple of offensive weapons to destroy and overcome the strategy of he who seeks to devour you. When we do this by the Spirit, we can't do this in our own strength. Of course, God and the light of the Holy Spirit is the power that destroys the darkness. But you have to realize what the plan is so that you know how to combat it. So the first thing, I'm going to give you a couple of things here that the enemy's personal plan is. From my experience over the years, this, this is what I have come to this conclusion, that number one, he wants to demoralize Christians. He wants to take your enthusiasm away and steal your joy. He wants you demoralized so that you have no kind of zeal for the things of the house of God. And most Christians don't, by the way. Most Christians love God. They want to go to heaven. But to go out there and do the work that he has called them to do, they don't respond to that at all. They're demoralized because the enemy wants them demoralized, and he has a way to do that. The second thing, this is still not working, Stevie. You sure I'm, pace, um, I'm pressing the right button? I put the second thing up, which is to frustrate. This is exactly what I'm talking about. All right. Secondarily, he wants to frustrate. This will come up in a couple minutes. You can jot it down. He wants to frustrate your plans. And a lot of Christians that I know of, because I'm a Christian counselor as well, I've been counseling for years and years and years, I will tell you there are a lot of frustrated Christians walking around. I don't know what I am, where I'm going. I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what my purpose in life is. I'm frustrated. Things don't seem to be breaking my way. I pray. I tithe. What's the problem with the finances? I'm in divorce situations, bad marriages, bad relationships. What's going on? They frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. It's part of the plan of the enemy. I promise you, 
Demoralization and frustration are not gifts of the Holy Spirit. They have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Thank you. I'm not frustrated anymore, Steve. Thanks. Third thing the enemy loves to do with Christians, he likes to divert you. He likes to take you off of what you're supposed to be doing and divert you into a path that is wasteful. To do things that are wasteful. To do things that are not profitable for you to do. To take up time and space. To make you do things that are unredemptive. They have no redeeming value in and of themselves. The enemy loves to do this with Christians. Rather than we focusing on the main thing in our life, we're focusing on the other things in our life that really are unredemptive. Is it more important for you to wash your dishes in the sink or to sit with the Lord when he tells you, I want to tell you something, take five minutes and pray? What we do is, rather than praying, we get diverted into doing other kinds of things. It is one of the master plans of the enemy to get you involved in things that dissipate your life and take up your time. Your time on this earth is the most precious commodity that you actually have. Time is the only thing that you cannot get back. You cannot get your life back, your time back. And you spend your time. We use that euphemism in the English language. Let's spend some time with the Lord. Let me spend some time with you. Well, what you're spending is right because it has a great value. It is more valuable than money. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you X amount of time on this earth. You won't know what the time is, but I'll, I know what the time is. And I'm going to give you X amount of time to accomplish everything that you need to accomplish. to glory. It's a constant growing and expanding and multiplying in the kingdom of God. It's fruit producing, in other words. And our life is supposed to be like that. But the enemy wants to come in and he says, I want to stop the tree from producing fruit. I want to stop you from ultimately fulfilling your call in the Lord. So he plans on immobilizing you. And if you feel immobilized, I'm going to tell you once again, this is not the Holy Spirit. God is not immobilizing you or holding you down or holding you still or shackling you to the same mundane existence day after day after day. That is not the Lord. It is not the Bible. It's not the Holy Spirit. It is a demonic trap and a strategy against the church and then lastly one of his favorite tricks to ultimately try to demise the church and to stop the church from overcoming is to divide from within may i call to your attention once again that the seven churches in 
the book of Revelation, which, by the way, are all in the area of where Turkey is now. These are all Islamic-held cities, as we've talked about before in here. All those seven churches, the church of Ephesus, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Smyrna, all those churches, those seven churches were very powerful churches at one time. The Lord had something on them. He wanted them to correct. He said, I know what you've done. You've lost your first love. He, he, he com, continually spoke to them about these demonic strategies. You tolerate Jezebel. You have this person in your congregation. You continue to let this go. The spirit of Jezebel, this witchcraft thing. He said, I'm going to put her on a sickbed and everybody else who kind of enjoys her, I'll put on a sickbed as well. He says, but... To him who overcomes, once again, I will give. Now, here's the problem. Seven churches, seven powerful churches, if you read church history, and you find out that every single one of those churches, even though it's only 2,000 years since those churches have been in existence, they're all gone. Everywhere, you, everywhere those churches were, I've even seen the ruins of some of them. It's, it's unbelievable to me that not only are all the churches gone, wiped off the face of the earth, they're all in Islamic-held territory. So obviously, something happened in the life of that church, in the life of that individual uh, city, in which someone did not respond, and the longevity and the history and the heritage of that church did not live on. It is, um, it is to each one of us to make sure that we preserve our heritage in the Lord and that we pass on to the next generation not only what we have, but something greater than we had at the beginning we give in the end. And then that generation becomes greater than our generation. Christianity should be growing and more powerful. Unfortunately, right now, the, the fastest growing religion in the earth right now is Islam. Unfortunately speaking. Their methodology of um, evangelism is uh, violence. And Christianity is love, but the, love's, the love is um, not penetrating the world in the same way that, it, it, that we were really called to penetrate the world in. The, the love of many men out there is waxing cold, and many people don't even want to hear the message of Christianity. But I will tell you this, that the Holy Spirit is lifting the veil off the eyes of many in these last days. And there's something that now is beginning and has been beginning for the last couple of years in which the tides are going to turn and there will be a great revival, even though there will be a great falling away before the great and terrible day of the Lord, there will also be a great revival. And many men and women with great hearts towards God will be brought into the kingdom of God. So be encouraged by that. But this is the demonic plan and demonic strategy of the enemy. And I want to um, just add one other factor to this. In 2007, while we were here in this building, a prophecy was given. I believe it was confirmed prophecy. Remember, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact is confirmed. By the mouth of two or three prophets, every word is confirmed. In 2007, a prophecy was given here. This was the part of that prophecy. that before we even moved here because of what the prophetic groups around the nation were saying about the specific areas of revival in the last days. And there were certain places in the United States that were um, streams were coming out of the map. Streams of water were bursting out of the ground like a great gusher, like a geyser type of thing. And they were in five specific locations. 
And this geyser coming up out of the ground was an indicator of the um, eruption of the Holy Spirit in a specific area. And then the overflow would go into the states that were surrounding it. But it would start in these five specific areas. Central Tennessee was one of those areas. Now, we had found out about that in Florida way before we came up here or even knew about. I didn't even know about Franklin, Tennessee or Spring Hill, Tennessee. I never even heard of them. So... That was a word that was um, previously given about revival. This word was given here about the open heaven. It says, and usually there's an open heaven before there's a revival, by the way. The Lord opens up the heaven through the prayers of the people and through the, uh, the, um, the consecration of the people, the zeal of the people, the hunger. He says, there's going to be an open heaven uh, over Tennessee, but... And this was the caveat, and this was the condition. Just like the conditions given to the churches in the book of Revelation, this is the one condition. The stronghold of religion must be broken. Now, I always felt that was a very interesting statement by the Holy Spirit, and I always know that we are always confronting an enemy from without. We know that the enemy cannot win when he is confronting us face to face. Jesus said it this way, the gates, which is authorities, the gates of hell, the authorities of hell will not prevail or cannot prevail against the church. That is a front to front, face to face combat response. The church will always win a fight against Satan face to face. When he comes as an authority, as a when he assaults the gates of the kingdom, we will always win that battle. However, that's not the only battle that's fought. It's not the only battle that's fought in your life either. There's another battle that's fought not from without, but from within. And when I heard this word, I know there's a spirit of religion in Tennessee. But all the pastors that are here will tell you that. The ones that are already here before us, they'll all tell you that. This place is one of the most religious places in the United States. You can just drive down US 31 over here, this road right outside the church building here. You can go down, you can count churches left and right all the way down the road. And there's really no population here to carry all those churches, but they're all over the place. Now, where I come from in Broward County, Florida, there's a million plus people there, and there's a handful of churches all over the place, but not like here. And the religion that is here is profound. And one of the things that religion does, and you can tell, it stifles the Holy Spirit. But there's always a lot of religious activity there's always a lot of, uh, you know, car washes and bake sales and this, that, and the other thing and Bible studies and this, that, and the other thing. But the Holy Spirit himself is quenched and many times even grieved in conditions where religion is allowed to prevail. So there is an assault from the outside, face to face. We will win that battle. But the most dangerous battle, the most dangerous battle in your life is not Satan's attack on you. It's what you tolerate within you. Remember that old saying, Pastor Kilpatrick, you deserve whatever you tolerate. You deserve whatever you tolerate. If you tolerate something in your life, it actually has a product. It produces something. And if you keep on tolerating this one thing and something starts getting cursed in your life, you can't complain to the Lord. Why didn't you protect me on this one? Why, did the, why is this stuff happening? Why is there sickness? Why is there poverty? Why is there lack? It is the same thing the Lord told to the churches in Revelation. He said, I wanted you to overcome. I pointed out to you these things. And I told you that if you would overcome the high place that you would be in me. But yet, somehow, some way, it has fallen into the hands of the enemy. And right now, 
uh, Islam is one of the most powerful enemies against the church. And those churches in Revelation, obviously, have fallen in that direction as well. What happened to the lights there, guys? All right. So there is going to be an open heaven over Tennessee, but the stronghold of religion must be broken. So the stronghold of religion that we need to be concerned about is not the one that's out there in the streets, but it's the one in our own personal lives. How many of you believe that even though you are spirit-filled, free, grace-oriented, charismatic, Pentecostal, full of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as the fruit of the Holy Spirit, how many of you recognize the fact that you could be subject to the spirit of religion? You can. You can be subject to the influence of the spirit of religion. And we find that the spirit of religion also brings a curse. The nature of the religious spirit is this. Go ahead and flip that up there, Steve, the, um, the definition. A religious spirit... The nature uh, that this spirit has is a demon which seeks to substitute religious activity or religious vernacular, religious speaking for the power of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. So what a religious spirit likes to do is substitute form over function. A religious spirit will, in fact, substitute an activity to keep you diverted from you actually engaging in the Lord on a personal level. That's one of the things that a religious spirit does. Secondarily, a religious spirit makes us judgmental. Religion makes us try to impose standards on others that are beyond what God has required for those others or has given the grace uh, for that time. See, everybody walks in a, a level of light. And one of the problems with being judgmental is that we are trying to always, number one, put standards on other people that are our own personal understandings. We start putting them on other people. And secondarily, many people are walking in different levels of light, and we fail to understand that. When a person is walking in a great deal of light for a long period of time, the standard is obviously very high. In other words, when you're walking through your walk in Christianity... The longer you walk with the Lord, the narrower the road gets. Do you remember when you were first born again? I remember when I was first born again. We were still doing some of the, the, the same stuff we were doing when we came out of the world. But as we were growing in the Lord, and as we were walking in the Holy Spirit, that road became narrower and narrower and narrower as we went down the corridor of life. So what we found out then is that holiness is not only a state of being, it's a process in your life. You don't get born again and all of a sudden you've, you're totally perfected. You're done. Wrap it up. You're the highest state that you're ever going to be in. You're the highest understanding that you're ever going to be in. You're the highest grace that you've, you're ever going to be in? No. What happens, even though you're in the state of holiness, the state of sanctification, you still have to go through the process of sanctification as well. Because we are human beings, and the Lord wants us to grow in grace and grow in his favor day by day. Now, the problem is, when you become an older Christian, and you went through the process of giving up smoking, giving up taking pills and alcohol and gambling and whatever else there is out there that you were kind of doing when you were a younger person, 
The problem is, is that when you get older and you, you start understanding how to overcome these things and have overcome them, in bops a young person or in bops a new Christian, and all of a sudden, their dress is a little short, maybe. Maybe their language is not as sanctified as yours. And the temptation now to put judgment on them starts to elevate seriously. Now, you say, well, what's the problem with that? There shouldn't be any problem with that. Well, there's a big problem with that because what happens with that is we begin to debase the body of Christ in such a way as it brings a curse on the body and it stops the whole group from moving forward. Now, I want to show you something here. Okay, so I want to clarify this because there's, there's several types of judging that are in the New Testament. First one is called crino. I think I've talked to you about this one before. This is the bad one. There are one bad one, two good ones. Three words for the word judging in the Bible. And when you read it, unfortunately, when you read the, the Bible, because the way it was translated into English, which Koine Greek is a stronger language than vernacular English, there's only one word. Three different words are translated one way. So the word krino, anacrino, and diacrino are all, in fact, translated in the word judgment, but they all don't mean the same thing. This is why the Bible was written in Koine Greek and wasn't written originally in English. Thank the Lord for that. So krino, the first word, is to condemn or to pass sentence or pronounce judgment on something or pass judgment on somebody. So in other words, you're already, you're already the judge and the jury in a specific issue in a person's life. Only God is allowed to operate in the area of krino or krinos. He's the only one that is permitted to do so. Christians are not allowed, are not allowed to operate in the word krino. You will find that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, when the Lord says, Judge not unless you want to be judged. He uses the word crino. He doesn't use the word anacrino or diacrino, which means to be discerned or to be examined or to be checked out. He uses the word crino, which means do not pass judgment. Do not pass sentence. Do not condemn. And if you do condemn, you will be condemned in the same manner that you condemn. You will be judged in the same manner that you will be judged. These are very harsh words coming from Jesus. And you say, well, I can't figure out why he's so strong on this. Now, doesn't he know that we're human beings? I mean, you know, our lips are a little loose here now and again. The problem is that Jesus understood something we never get a grasp of. The reason that he was so strong on it is because he knew the destructive power of it. He knew that judgment Crino in the church would devastate the church. We don't see it like that. We see it like a social activity. Because we are all spiritual, we can get together and say, hey, well, you see, you, you check her out the other day, man. She, uh, you know the language on that kid, boy, I tell you, man. And all of a sudden, we don't understand that we have severed the bond of unity and love with that individual. Jesus understood it. That's why he said it. We want to water it down a little bit and say, well, Lord, take it easy here. Take it easy here. I mean, we're just, you know, we're all your people here, and we're all doing great works for you. We're all hyper-spiritual. You know, we're not smoking dope anymore. So why can't we just talk about, you know, uh, uh, this guy didn't do that or this is not up to par in that person's life or they have fallen short in this area? Why can't we just say that? Why can't we just pass a couple of sentences? Every time you sit in a congregation and you hear a message that really convicts you, 
You know that you have the spirit of religion at work when you say, gee, I wish Harry was back here listening to this. Boy, he really needs, he's the one that needs to hear this message today. I wish Chuck was here to hear this message, man. This is was designed for him. Not me, of course, but for him. That's when you know that something's cooking inside that is severing the bond of unity. Jesus identified this, he understood it, and he took a very hard line position on it. Don't do it. Now, of course, we do it anyway. But he said, don't do it. So krino means to condemn, pass sentence, or pronounce judgment against. The word anacrino means to evaluate or to examine to discern. This is the spirit of discerning. When you have to judge something, you have to discern. The Bible actually tells you, I want you to judge spirits. So people say all the time, well, you know, the Bible tells us we can judge. And there are many scriptures that talk about both anacrino and diacrino in that way. And, that, and that's very true, and that's very right. You have to learn to understand that sin in our lives is not to be tolerated by each other. We're not to congratulate each other in our sin. We're supposed to help each other. Let you who are spiritual correct the one, but do it in a manner of love and respect and honor and dignity. We're designed to be sounding boards for each other, but we are not designed to pass judgment on one another. It is only when you are willing to die for a person or understand that concept of unity of the body of Jesus Christ, that you are really able to correct someone in that way, which with a rebuke or an admonition or an exhortation. So anacrino means you can evaluate, you can examine, you can discern. And that word diacrino is a, it's a little bit of a deeper word than anacrino. It means to separate out. Dia means actually to, to divide something, to separate out. So you look at something and, and, it, and you see a lump and you say, well, this is a little bit of leaven. I want to separate that out. You can do that. But you recognize the fact that it is not passing judgment. It means to make a distinction or discriminate between things. You can judge. You can judge a pie-eating contest, but it doesn't mean that you're going to con pass judgment or condemn. Now, also, uh, just uh, for semantics sake, the word that we have in the English language called criticize comes from the Greek word krino. You can actually hear that in there. It's a transliterated word. So krino and criticize are Greek and English for exactly the same word. So when you are criticizing other people, this is the operative word word and the operative action so jesus would say this in this manner in matthew 7 in the same respect do not criticize one another unless you want to be criticized don't examine another person in that manner unless you want to be examined and he made this point about you know a, a, a brother trying to correct another brother and Jesus was upset about that, and he says, listen. He says, before you remove the speck out of your brother's eye, he says, take the log out of your own eye, and then, and only then, will you be able to see clearly enough to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So you know what he was driving at there. Judge not, lest you are subject to the same kind of judgment. It's a pretty strong word coming from the Lord. So our word criticize comes from there, and that's very important that you understand that, the, that um, being critical of one another is, once again, not one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Where does judging come from? Let's just go over this real quick. I'm going to try to fly through this here. Judging usually comes from, in a, in a Christian's life, through several different means. The uh, first and probably the primary one is rejection. If you have a spirit of rejection in your life, even though you're a born-again Christian, how many of you know you can have a spirit of rejection? Yeah, that's a haunting spirit. It comes from your past. 
It comes from uh, places in your life where you have been wounded by somebody or you have been rejected and that spirit kind of hangs around you. Remember, once again, you're Christians. You cannot be possessed by a spirit, but you can be harassed or oppressed by a spirit. There's a difference between, be, between being possessed and oppressed. Christians can be oppressed by demons. We have seen this year after year after year. This is why Christians go for deliverance. But they are not possessed. Why? Because possession denotes ownership. And you are owned by the, the blood of the lamb. You are, the price was paid. We belong to Jesus. We don't belong to the kingdom of darkness. But the kingdom of darkness wants to oppress us. So you can have spirits of asthma. You can have spirits of uh, uh, anxiety. You can have false fears, phobias. These are all demonic things. These are not gifts from the Lord. And Christians can have them, even though you're full of the Holy Spirit. You have to learn how to overcome them, learn how to destroy your enemy. So when you have rejection or a wounded spirit, the tendency to want to judge another person starts to elevate. Because one of the things that happens with a rejected person or a person with a wounded spirit, they have real low self-esteem in a lot of areas. And somehow to level the playing field of life with other relationships, you can do it two ways. You can rise up or you can tear down the person that is next to you. And if you're tearing down people that are next to you so that you can elevate, it's probably coming out of something inside of us that is wounded, hurt, or rejected. Criticizing other people usually can come from this kind of uh, activity. Second is an actual religious spirit. Some people have it because it is a spirit. There is a spirit of religion walking the earth. And when a person is influenced by this spirit, you wind up being God's cop. So in other words, you studied real hard, you try to toe the line, you work real hard at being a Christian, and then that gives you sort of a badge of authority to kind of overview the congregation of the Lord and become God's cop. So you're cleaning up Dodge City for the Lord. And the religious spirit will do that, and it will, it will take the, the, the place of authority when that authority has not been given. So be careful when you get in a posture or a position where the Lord is really working with you, he's growing with you, he's giving you insight and understanding, that you don't take that as a badge of authority to judge the person that is next to you because they might not be in the same level of light that you are walking in. They're in a different phase of the process. So humility is probably a great key there. Thirdly, pride or sense of superiority. Um, pride can be personal. It has nothing to do with spiritual things. You can have pride uh, being non-spiritual. So, but personal pride is very dangerous. When you have a sense of superiority and then you start judging and criticizing, it winds up costing you your position. Now, what is the greatest example of this in the entire Bible? Satan. Satan was, by all accounts of most of the scholars, he was the worship leader in heaven. Three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Lucifer was called Lucifer before he was called Satan because Lucifer means clear, bright, shining one. He was the one with the timbrels and the, and the tambourines and all that stuff like that. He was the guy in heaven that had, was in charge of a third of the angels, and he was the, the worship leader in heaven. He was handsome and all this other stuff, all these um, kind of symbols and similes and metaphors that are given about him especially in Ezekiel, you find out that this guy was a pretty powerful dude. But his pride elevated him to a point where he started to criticize, guess who? He starts criticizing God. He starts casting judgment over the 
way things are run. And then you find the five I wills in the book of Isaiah. I will sit on the, assembly, the mountain and the assembly of the sides of the north. And Satan's all, I will, I will, I will. And the Lord says, oh, yeah? And he picks him up and casts him out of heaven. He loses his position because he had pride. And let me say this to you, brothers and sisters, with all due deference, pride always comes before a fall. And religious pride is no different than human pride. It will cause you to fall. But if you are humble, you will be exalted. You'll be lifted up. God will exalt that which is humble before his eyes, but he will take down that which is prideful. And most judging comes from pride. So you can see how dangerous this is. It can cost you the place that you're supposed to be going, which is your destiny. Fourthly, um, sometimes judging comes from ignorance, lack of understanding. People just don't get it. They don't read the Bible. They don't have the, the gravitas or the gravity, if you will, about what is going on here. What 